Hi, I promised that we would get back to this multi-air and this is going to be part two of the diagnostics and what you can see on the screen right now is an in-cylinder cranking compression test. This is cylinder number one on the bottom and I don't know how well you can see this on the screen right here but we've got about 44 psi of, com of cranking compression and experienced users for the pressure transducer I want you to look right here at the exhaust valve opening does that look right it's not definitive at this point but what is your first thought right now does that look like it's supposed to for a cranking test and it, this is a clear leaning tower this is a great example of the cylinder leaking because you can see that this side over here is much wider than this one. And when we get this great big pocket, that's showing us that some of the air that was in the cylinder while we were cranking it over has leaked out. Look up above. See the intake manifold waveform? So that's manifold vacuum. And you can see that we've got, and they're kind of clipped, but we've got decent valleys here. But look at this one, when number one is coming up, has compression on it. Can you tell that we're pushing those gases back into the intake? So we've definitely got an intake valve problem, but we got a problem here too. One of the things that I just did is that is the same waveform that you just saw moments ago. And what I've done is I've added a pistons overlay so that you can see where each cylinder is and that's primarily for the vacuum waveform up here at the top but here's number one coming up under compression and of course you can see that we've got all of this distortion compared to the other cylinders but then when number three is coming up under compression there it is number four coming up under compression number two coming up under compression so this lets us line up that waveform Keep in mind, one of the things that affects the shape of these waves is how fast the piston is moving. The piston moves the slowest at top dead center and bottom dead center. It moves very quickly, of course, at the 90 degree point. So it actually makes sense that you get your strongest pull while the cylinder, the piston is moving the fastest. So you can see that we've got our pull each time while each individual piston is moving at its top speed. But because we are blowing gases back into the intake manifold from cylinder number one, it's distorting the intake pull for cylinder number four. This is a waveform that some of our advanced users have been waiting for. This is cylinder number one with the engine running at idle. How's our exhaust cam timing look? And it's if you look up here at the top, we're hitting about 99 PSI of compression at idle. There's a reason that it's that high. For one thing, this car is not producing much vacuum. Uh, you can see we're where zero is over here, that's, and I'll, I'll give you another picture on this, but that would be atmospheric pressure. This is the actual main vacuum we're pulling, but this is what's in the intake. And notice how the exhaust pocket is lower than the intake pocket. You can see it here, and I'll put in a different overlay. I'll put a couple more slides on here just for you to look at that detail. It's kind of cleaned up our vacuum waveform a little bit too because there's less time to push the gases back into the intake. That's why the compression's higher. Cranking, everything's moving so slow, there's a lot of time for the gases to leak out. I'm not going to be the least bit surprised to find out that the valves on cylinder number one are bent. But what about this exhaust valve timing? I looked up service information and the Exhaust valve is supposed to open up at 34 degrees before bottom dead center. Well, 34 degrees before bottom dead center is over here. 
that's opening up at about bottom dead center. Probably one to two teeth on the timing belt late. Take a look at this side of the waveform. Over here, the exhaust cam is clearly retarded, and you can see that we're coming up. There's our exhaust stroke. We come across, look at our intake timing. You know, if the exhaust valve is out of time, should the intake valve be in time? Are we actually looking at the intake valve opening, or are we looking at it leaking? Think about that for a little bit. Okay, I just showed you cylinder number one, exhaust pocket to the intake pocket. When you're first learning to do this kind of testing, it really helps to take a second cylinder, uh, one that you know that's firing, so it should be a known good, and see how it appears compared to the cylinder that you have a question with. Look at our exhaust pocket. And see, I put a cursor on here. Notice how the exhaust and the intake are pulling to approximately the same vacuum level. This upper cursor is actually atmospheric pressure. That's at zero. And this is how much vacuum we're pulling. Remember how number one was clear down here? You don't see that on cylinder number three. Because, again, number one's leaking. Number three is not. So this is a fairly normal looking waveform. We still have to see what the cam timing is. So the last little thing I'm going to show you is let's look at our cam timing. Exhaust valve should be opening at 34 degrees before bottom dead center. I could go through the effort of measuring where that exhaust valve is opening on the waveform, but I can tell you just by looking at it, it is not 34 degrees before bottom dead center. It's way too close. And it should be closing two degrees after top dead center. So there's very little overlap on this unless the intake valve creates it. Now the intake valve should be opening about 11 degrees before top dead center. Uh, notice we're closing about 58 degrees after bottom dead center. That is the entire lobe. Being a multi-air, the computer can decide when it wants to open and close the valve anytime between these two points. And it can even open and close it multiple times and change whether it's just a tiny opening or a larger opening. I've got some waveforms captured from some other vehicles that the multi-air does something that's really neat. You'll actually see the cylinder pull into a vacuum and then it kind of blips some air in and then it goes back into a vacuum. Of course, it goes up, but that's all it took in order to put enough air into the cylinder for the conditions that the engine was running in. So, you know, these look different when we're looking at these waveforms compared to a typical engine. But this Dodge Dart, this is a slam dunk. He's got intake valves damaged. He's losing compression. And the timing belt's out of time. So this is clearly coming back apart. Now, the person who owns it is actually a used car dealer. He's going to have to make a decision. Does he really want to try to fix it again? Or is this going to be back to the auction? Or maybe even put a used engine in it? That'll be... Totally up to him. That'll be his decision. At this point, I've done my part. I'm giving them a list of, of what it needs, and they can decide what they want to do from there. So any questions, uh, put them down below. And I hope you like this little example of the right way to go about doing diagnostics. And the total time for me to do these diagnostics, including you know capturing of all this information, is less than an hour. In fact, it's about 40 minutes for the grand total for everything that I did. And I want you to think about how much time you could actually spend usually doing your diagnostics trying to figure out why a cylinder's misfiring.